absolutely delighted and thrilled to have Charlotte Gray with us tonight for her presentation on the promise of Canada. Please join me in welcoming Charlotte Gray. Thank you. That's great. Jamie, thank you for the most uh, fabulous introduction. I mean, we had a fabulous dinner and then I had a fabulous introduction and I just hope I can live up to that billing. Um, it's uh, very impressive too to have this audience on a night when I think many of us think it would be a really good idea to stay home near the far. So thank you all for coming because I, uh, it's one of the things I still haven't quite got over, uh, the shock of the Canadian winter. And it comes, you know, lightning speeds right down the Ottawa Valley. And so you get it about five minutes before I do in Ottawa. And, uh, you know, sort of, we are a very resilient people. So I wanted to talk tonight about uh, The Promise of Canada, uh, the book that I decided to write when I realized that uh, we were coming up to a big birthday, the anniversary of the British North America Act. And I decided that it was a moment on, at which I could reflect on what this country is all about. So as you've heard, although you'd never ever guess it from my accent, I wasn't born here. I arrived nearly 40 years ago as an immigrant, and ever since then, I've been intrigued by a set of questions that strike many newcomers. What is the glue that holds this country together? What makes it different from all other countries? And what does it mean to be Canadian? Now, when I arrived here in 1979, I discovered that I was not the only person who was asking these questions. In fact, many people who were born in this country were asking the same questions. It was around that si same time that uh, Robertson Davis, the novelist, uh, said, Canada's not a country you love. It's a country that you worry about. And that was because I arrived in the middle of the um, first uh, referendum, the first uh, nationalist crisis in Quebec. Um, the Canadian sense of identity was particularly wobbly. Uh, we had the first Quebec referendum in 1980. Here you can see just after that vote, which uh, was actually won by the, um, the, the federal Federalists within Quebec. Uh, but here is a separatist drowning his sorrows in a Montreal fountain. And uh, everybody knew that that issue was not solved. And since then, the country has gone through so many more crises, several more political tensions, at least three major economic meltdowns, huge surges of new immigrants from all over the world, a shift of power westward, a creative explosion in the arts, particularly literature. And there have been new heroes. Yet the longer I've lived here, the more I've realized that underneath the political battles and the demographic churn, there are aspects of this country that have been quietly solidifying. In fact, you know, there's an unobtrusive continuity about Canada that we so take for granted that many of us are simply not aware of it. But think about it. How did we get from this, those British immigrants arriving in the early 20th century, working class Brits escaping the uh, industrial slums of mainly the north of England and of London, uh, coming to a land that they were told had so much potential, so much promise. Just over a hundred years later, another group of immigrants that you'll recognize, Syrian refugees, again, coming to a country they knew had so much potential, so much promise, both groups being welcomed in their day. What are the threads that connect the Fathers of Confederation, top right hand, 23 very straight white men. And our global superstar, Drake, bottom right hand, bottom left hand corner, who is just known all over the world, huge superstar, but is absolutely adamant. I mean, he always talks about Toronto, remains very loyal. How has the artistic vision of Canada evolved from this? Who doesn't recognize a Tom Thompson canvas? Uh, and, you know, the group of seven who came after Tom Thompson, known as Canada's National Wallpaper because of endlessly uh, reproduced landscapes. But this is also another vision of Canada, 
Ken Monkman's extraordinary and wonderful painting. Ken Monkman is a uh, Cree artist. This is a painting he did for the new Art Gallery of Ontario <clears throat> when it reopened, um, with many elements of the Canadian identity in it, both our classical heritage coming from the European influence, the uh, First Nations um, uh, elements in it, the Victorian sentimentality, an extraordinary work showing just what an, a jigsaw this country is. Because, you know, Canada has constantly reimagined itself in each successive generation since 1867 and has quietly overcome stresses that could have shipwrecked it. So I began to think about what aspects of Canadian history and society make this country unique and who helped embed those values and ideas in the national psyche. The challenge was how to weave so many disparate threads into one book, a book, moreover, that people would want to read, even though it was that dreaded subject, Canadian history. I knew I had to play to my strengths as a biographer and a writer of popular history. So I decided to come at the question from a very diff different angle. Which ideas tie us together? And then who championed or embodied those ideas? Because there is no single narrative in our multi-layered history, just as no single image can capture the country. This is a country of conundrums and contradictions and long-running disagreements which have not been solved and may be insoluble. So a biographical approach made sense because my chosen subjects could be my way into a larger story, the Canada in which they had been raised, their contribution to an evolving national identity. I made a couple of very bold decisions. One was I was not going to include, include among my biographical subjects any prime ministers. This was not going to be a top-down story. And anyway, the best of them have already had wonderful biographies of their own. I'm sure many of you have looked at Richard Gwynne's volumes, two volumes on John A. MacDonald, uh, the, our first Canadian prime minister up there on the left, and then below, Pierre Trudeau. I know that in this room there are many people who, in fact, still, when you say Prime Minister Trudeau, think of uh, Trudeau pair. But you know there's a lot of Canadians today who don't even know there was ever another prime minister called Trudeau. Our knowledge of history is pretty thin. But second, the next decision I made was much bolder. No hockey players. <laughs> There's a simple reason for this omission that I didn't write about hockey. I would have absolutely no credibility on this subject. A good friend has never stopped reminding me that when I first arrived in uh, Canada, I was writing an article for a British magazine on a political rally that was taking place in the National Forum, and in, in the uh, Montreal Forum. And I had to call him and say, what game is played? in the Montreal Forum. He's never let me forget that. And despite working very hard to become a bilingual hockey mum, I'm afraid I still don't understand what icing is. But I looked for individuals who could, as it were, hold a reader's hand as I traced the evolution of the national psyche from the moment that the ink was dry on the British North America Act in 1867 until the present day. I wanted to explore Canada from its historic roots to its post-national present. And as the subtitle of The Promise of Canada explains, this is a book about the people and ideas that have shaped our country. So it was a challenge to put this tapestry together. I was looking for individuals who would provide a window into some aspect of our identity as it emerged over the past 150 years. But at the same time, I wanted to fit my chosen Canadians into a narrative of modern Canada. And I had to ensure that the book covered as much of our country and its different peoples as possible. I couldn't have everybody coming from Ontario. And I also wanted to put some women into Canadian history. So often our history has been about politicians, men, explorers, men, soldiers, men, hockey players. What do these groups have in common? But I knew there must have been some women in the past. 
So this was my challenge. Now, the ideas that I started with, well, some of them were about the sturdy institutional structures that in fact do glue us together. Federalism as the basic building block of our country's system of government. So I began there. Our healthcare system, a hard fought battle in the 1960s, but now Medicare has come to be one of this country's most cherished characteristics. So that had to be there. And then of course, there's the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, a relatively recent innovation, but it's had a powerful effect on the way we think about the rights of Canadian citizens. And then there are other aspects of our national identity that are more intangible. Our geography is crucial, as are the various ways we've conceived of this vast and often unknowable landscape. And then over the century and a half, musicians, writers, and artists have sketched out a distinctly Canadian culture. I don't think I need to tell anyone who this is. She's, um, and actually this is the most wonderful new biography just um, been published of Joni Mitchell. And especially in recent years, some individuals have forced the compromises required to keep this country united. Because you know, if there's one national characteristic that's quintessentially Canadian, it's pragmatism. The 35 million people who live here do not look, speak, or pray alike, but for the most part, we have learned to share this land and live in neighborly sympathy. We accommodate different points of view. Throughout my life here, I've watched governments broker different interests in the face of a powerful surge of, Canadian, of Quebec nationalism, a sense of grievance in the West when they thought their interests were being ignored, the struggle of Canada's indigenous people to have their rights recognized. This is the Idle No More movement in the 2014. And just to go back to that point about we've learned to uh, compromise, one of my enduring memories of my first year in Canada was that I was always amazed that, you know, if I sort of said something that was provocative or shocking, I knew that in England, if I said that, somebody would say, oh, rubbish. In Canada, if I said anything provocative or shocking, people would say, that's interesting. <laughs> Careful avoidance of conflict. So who did I choose to represent these bedrock ideas and values? My choices included three political leaders, a policeman, an OG Cree leader, a writer, and a lawyer, and an artist. And I'm not going to go through my whole catalog with you tonight, don't worry but I'm going to highlight a couple in order to give you a taste of my approach. So I begin the story of the last 150 years of our history with Georges Etienne Cartier, whose contribution to Canada, to Canadian stability over time, has been overshadowed by the achievements of his more charismatic and longer living colleague, John A. Macdonald. What was Cartier's big idea? an idea that is entirely taken for granted within our borders today. Back in the 1860s, Cartier insisted that the new dominion of Canada that he and John A. were promoting should have a federal structure. MacDonald didn't think much of this idea. He wanted the new country that he was putting together to have one strong central government, like the motherland, as Britain was called back then, he wanted a Westminster style of uh, government. But Cartier said, no, we can't have one central government running everything throughout the country because he knew that the French-speaking residents of Quebec or Lower Canada, as it was called then, would rapidly be swamped by English-speaking Canadians. They would lose their language, their unique le legal system, their distinctive culture, their Canada. There were too many examples of such phenomena elsewhere. The French-speaking citizens of Louisiana, for instance, had entirely lost their language or their French identity. So through all those months of discussing Confederation, beginning in Charlottetown in 1864 and ending at Westminster three years later, Cartier made it clear to his partner, MacDonald, that the only way he would bring the crucial support of Lower Canada to the deal was if the new entity called Canada was a federation. And without Cartier's support, 
John A. could never have put the deal together. So, no Cartier, no Quebec. No Quebec, no Canada. I promise you, we would have been Americans. Of course, it is MacDonald who's given the credit for Confederation, and he certainly deserves a lot of it. He had a big vision. But it was Cartier who ensured a political structure for the country that has held together even as this country has exploded in wealth, population, and prosperity, and territory. So in each of my portraits, I've tried to show how my subjects' backgrounds and experiences shaped or reflected their ideas. And with Cartier, there is a lovely illustration of his ability to juggle two realities. So in his political life, he was juggling two realities, the needs of the new country to, to be formed, to be born, and the interests of English Canadians versus French Canadians. In his private life, there was another juggling act because superficially, he was an incredibly respectable lawyer, merchant in Montreal, member of the bourgeoisie there, married to the uh, mayor, and um, never and a very spiffy dresser, always uh, seen as Mr. Respectability. But at the same time, he had the most interesting mistress, Luce de Cavillier. Now, I know she looks a bit stuffy here, but I can tell you that away from the camera, she was anything but. She modeled herself on the French novelist, Aurore Dupin, better known as Georges Sand, who had much publicized affairs with A-list celebrities like musician Frédéric Chopin and the writer Alfred de Musset. Like Georges Sand, Luce de Cavillier enjoyed wearing trousers, smoking cigars, and breaking social codes. So Cartier knew all about balancing different interests. Of course, now you, know, you hear this story and you think this is shocking. This is a, a, a level of hypocrisy that would never be tolerated today. You can't retrofit today's values on yesterday. So in The Promise of Canada, a reader rolls through the years, the major events of our shared past, and some of the individuals who nurtured the evolving sense of national identity. Each portrait is embedded within a narrative that covers the milestones of our shared past. Here's a picture of a residential school in the early 20th century. I can't believe there's anyone in this room that doesn't read that headline and wince. We know how incredibly cruel those residential schools were, how toxic the legacy, how, how appalling the, the idea that uh, the, not the indigenous culture that those children should have been brought up within was being eliminated. But you can see there that that's what the powers that be thought should be happening. And then, of course, there's Canada's service in the uh, two world wars. Here's the Vimy Monument, uh, which commemorates the extraordinary contributions of the Canadians uh, during the First World War to the defense of the British Empire. One of the most poignant photos in the book is this one. This is a Saskatchewan farmer watching the topsoil just blow off his farm in the 1930s. The 1930s, the Depression swept North America. Nowhere was it felt more harshly than in the Canadian prairies. The combination of the precipitous drop in uh, wheat prices and the um, a appalling drought uh, had farm families literally starving to death. But the second of the portraits I'm going to mention tonight is that of Margaret Atwood, who was my route into the birth of Can Lit and also the exuberant nationalism of the 1960s, the decade when this country got its own flag, hosted Expo 67, and elected Pierre Trudeau as prime minister. I particularly love that um, Expo 67 picture, don't you? think those drum majorettes on the top of the letters are uh, pretty energetic. I had a long interview for this book with Margaret Atwood, who, as we all know, is one of the most perceptive observers of both this country and of contemporary preoccupations. I'd read and enjoyed several of her novels while I was still in England, and in fact, her heroines were sufficient to persuade me that I might find a few kindred spirits in Canada. But it was not until I arrived here that I realized 
quite how sharp her observations were. As a very young woman, she thought that the Canadian sense of identity was needlessly fragile. And she set about addressing this through her analysis of our fiction. In 1972, she published Survival, a thematic guide to Canadian literature. In the introduction, she wrote, I'm talking about Canada as a state of mind, as the space you inhabit, not just with your body, but with your head. And she contrasted the themes that run through American and British fiction with those that run through novels by Canadians. She pointed out that in Britain, the theme is Britain as an island. This is sort of deeply embedded in the British psyche. Boy, can we ever see that today with the Brexit vote, this sense of sort of superiority of the island people and the need to sort of maintain that insularity. The American theme is the frontier. The Americans constantly conquering nature, pushing west, um, fighting on the frontier, and um, making it big. But she pointed that out that Canadian stories are likely to be tales not of those who made it, but of those who made it back from the awful experience. The north, the snowstorm, the sinking ship that killed everyone else. The survivor has no triumph or victory, but the fact of his survival. One of the favorite, my favorite uh, books, early books by uh, Margaret Atwood is this book of poems, The Journals of Susanna Moody. Now she wrote these extraordinary poems when she was very young. There was barely a publishing industry in Canada. And she herself printed this book and designed the layout and designed the cover herself. And um, so she, what she was trying to illustrate in the poems was just how devastated Susanna Moody was by when she arrived in Canada and found out where she'd come to and the fact that she had to begin her, re begin her life here, practically by, first of all, building a log cabin to live in. Now, as some of you might know, I wrote a book about Susanna Moody and her sister, Catherine Partrail, Sisters in the Wilderness. So I've always had a particular uh, place in my heart for this book. What, um, what Margaret Atwood was trying to do with this cover was to just illustrate that Susanna Moody was knocked sideways by the experience. And I, I think she's caught that, don't you? The survival theme reflected the enduring anxiety back then about Canada's identity. Atwood wrote that Canadians are forever taking the national pulse like doctors at a sick bed. The aim is not to see whether the patient will, will live well, but simply whether he will live at all. So much has changed since then, and today's Canlit is a much more robust, diverse creature. There are fewer shipwrecks, there's more urban angst. Many really successful novels are actually not set in Canada at all. But Atwood did more than simply prove that a Canadian author can both illuminate the national psyche and win a huge national, international audience, and do it with a wit that totally belies the caricature of Canadians as humorless. She also nurtured the growth of Canlit by being a founder of the organizations like the Writers' Union of Canada, the Writers' Trust, Pen Canada, and several other organizations. I have to admit, it's actually very intimidating to interview Margaret Atwood. I'd heard so many stories before I actually met her. Well, I'd met her before this, but um, one of my favorite stories was told to me by an Englishman who said, my goodness, you're going to meet her. A friend of mine went up to her and said, oh, you're Margaret Atwood. My wife reads your books. And she said, well, what are you reading, big boy? <laughs> that gimless, gimlet gaze, that famously sharp tongue. However, she is deeply Canadian. She understands this country. And I did ask her whether the same themes of survival still dominate literature in our country. And she replied tersely, you can never escape the weather. That's actually like yesterday, isn't it? So in The Promise of Canada, I was determined to integrate the past with the present and show the sturdy evolution 
that continues. Now, there are individuals who highlight the dark history of Canada's Indigenous peoples and their continuing struggle to have their rights recognized. Here's Elisha Harper, the OG Cree band chief who blocked passage of a constitutional deal in 1990, the Meech Lake Accord. There were actually so many Indigenous leaders I could have selected, but I kept thinking, you know, I really want to connect with readers, and what do... What is the image that many, many people will remember? And I think several of you in this room probably remembers this image of uh, Chief Harper sitting in the Manitoba legislature holding his eagle feather and just quietly saying no. So that that deal, which had, was a deal between English and French speaking Canadians and had completely ignored the um, requests and demands of indigenous people, uh, he made sure on behalf of uh, the First Nations that <clears throat> the, the deal didn't go through. He was an extraordinary person to write about because in his history, in his personal story, he embodied the story of, of uh, the First Nations. He was born on one of the poorest reserves in Canada, the Red Sucker Lake in North Eastern Manitoba, which you can only get to by float plane in the summer and an ice road in the summer. It remains one of the poorest reserves. He, when he was very small, he was suddenly whisked away from his family. They never, under, never knew why. They didn't, he didn't discover for years late, until years later that he'd had TB. He was taken to a hospital on the other side of the province where he learned a different kind of Cree so that when he went home, his mother didn't understand a word he was saying. Then he went to residential school where he was abused. Amazingly, he did persevere through his education and was one of a handful of uh, First Nations students who went to university in the 1970s. And he emerged, despite his incredible shyness, I mean, he was a very shy man. You can see there some of the sort of resistance to uh, actually having to, he, he was very uncomfortable with the ro role into which he'd been thrust. But he, he went into politics and had an extraordinary impact. And his impact was Canadians did at that point really begin to pay attention to what had happened to indigenous people in this country. So every time, you know, I'm often in places, as I'm sure you are, where you start off with somebody saying, I acknowledge that I'm on the unceded territory of the Algonquin peoples. That all dates from uh, that stand by Elijah H Harper, recognition of uh, land rights. I examine the impact of the West's demands for a greater political say through a portrait of Pre Preston Manning. Now, this was very controversial that I should include him, especially, you can imagine, because I live in Ottawa, uh, within a nest of um, public servants uh, who saw this man coming in and sort of really trying to sort of thrashing around, trying to do a mini Donald Trump on the, on the Ottawa bureaucracy. Uh, why would you want to write about him, they said. And similarly, so did some of the uh, po politicians in established parties, both the former Progressive Conservative Party and the Liberal Party. But it was interesting, when I was doing the book tour across Canada, uh, the further west I went, the more people said, I'm so glad you included Preston Manning. I'm so glad our voices are in your book, that our sense that... Uh, we were being stitched up by Central Canada is, uh, is reflected in what you've written. And the other thing, reason I really enjoyed writing about Preston Manning uh, is that he represents a theme throughout the last 150 years in Canada, which is our populist movements. Whether you're talking about the Farmers Party in Ontario or um, the Social Credit in Quebec, by and large, the extremist element in those parties, dating from the early 20th century, has not had the kind of sort of xenophobic, misogynist, racist edge that you do see in the populist movements in European countries, and in fact on the uh, extreme end of the, some of the Republican um, fringe parties in, in the United States. He was very, very careful, Manning. He had a political goal that he wanted to rewrite the uh, terms of confederation, but he did not want 
to alienate people by um, uh, allowing the crazes to uh, just go after s sort of solid Canadian values. One of his statements he always said is, well, you know, when somebody says, you have this lunatic from northern Alberta saying that uh, uh, home, um, gay people should be shot. And he'd say, you know, when you turn on a light, you always get a few bugs. <laughs> I've also highlighted some of today's Canadians who are shaping our collective tomorrow. Here's a couple. People like Calgary Mayor Nahid Nenshi, amazing, a Muslim in Canada's most, uh, as mayor of Canada's most right-wing um, city, and he's just been re-elected. Or the artist Doug Copeland in the bottom there, a world-renowned artist who's thought a lot about what does Canadian identity mean. These are people who are continuing the national conversation about our identity as Canadians. You know, when I arrived here in 1979, Canada, as I said, was a little bit wobbly. In fact, it was pretty wobbly. People were talking about, you know, can Canada survive? And I came from a country, Britain, that had never looked more united. You cannot take anything for granted. Today, Canada has never looked more solid, and the United Kingdom is looking distinctly disunited with the uh, Wales and Scotland and Northern Ireland pulling away from London. You can't take anything for granted. And in Britain, you know, there's no equivalent to this kind of image, an image that captures the extraordinary diversity of the Canadian population. Our former governor general, Mikhail Jean, who arrived here as a Haitian refugee, doing a blanket toss with a Nunavut elder when uh, the territory of Nunavut was first formed in the 1990s. I love that picture because I just think, in what other country would those two people be uh, doing anything together, let alone a, a blanket toss? And here's another image that underlines Canada's uniqueness because only Canadians understand its significance. Here we have Gordon Downey, his last and poignant concert when the tragically hit paid, played in, in uh, Kingston, uh, about 15, well, gosh, a year and a half ago now, um, everybody knew how terribly ill he was. The Prime Minister, Justin Trudeau, went. And so for young, young Canadians, this is the kind of image which they know immediately what it's all about. And many of them know what that conversation is all about. It's one that has tremendous resonance with Canadian youth because what Gordon Downey is saying to Justin Trudeau is, don't forget to keep your promises to Indigenous peoples. I think that outside Canada, if you ask Canadians, if you ask people outside Canada sort of what, it, what, it, what is a Canadian image, most people would say, oh, the Mountie. Within Canada, it's these kind of images that in fact do, collect, do sort of resonate with younger Canadians. I had a lot of fun writing this book because it gave me the challenge of fitting together into one narrative everything I've observed and learned in my 38 years here. It took me into different places, different lives, and there's nothing a biographer likes more than making new friends among the dead. I also had some pretty good experiences that I wanted to build in. Who in this room has had this experience in Newfoundland, kissing a cod? Some of you must have been screeched in, hooray, yes. You know, on, on the Atlantic coast, coast, that's the kind of uh, experience where you realize Canada has a folkloric and a humor, folkloric tradition and a humor that uh, isn't replicated, uh, is, is, is completely unique. But then I had another experience that maybe I'd be amazed, I hope somebody in this room has uh, been to Dawson City and uh, tried a sour toe cocktail. Anyone done that one? The sour toe cocktail is something, when you go to the downtown hotel in Dawson City, uh, you, can be, you can buy a cocktail, which is from uh, a shot from a bottle of spirits that has in it a toe that is supposedly from 
the, uh, a miner from the 1890s gold rush who died and was uh, frozen solid in a uh, pile of ice until the body finally emerged and the toe fell off and was put in this bottle of spirits. And now it's a tradition that you can, um, you can buy a shot of it. Uh, it's pretty disgusting, but what's even more disgusting is that every now and then somebody is so drunk, they drink the whole thing, including the toe. <laughs> it's a miracle. The next day, there's the bottle, and there's another toe in there. <laughs> so I always wonder how many, how many uh, prospectors died in the 1890s <laughs> gold rush. Writing the book forced me to get below the static of today's concerns and explore what historian Desmond Morton has called the great quiet continuity of life in a vast and generous land. I'm not Pollyanna. Canada still has problems. Canadians still debate who we are. Many issues are never settled. But writing The Promise of Canada did answer some of my questions about what holds this country together and what it means to be Canadian. And I hope it answers some of your questions too. Thank you.